We started with our final keynote. Here is His Eminence, Archbishop Paul. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is born. Glorified. Christ is born. Glorified. Christ is born. Glorified. Well, we come to the pinnacle now. Uh, the last question that was asked of me to speak about. And it's put simply, how can we apply Peter's desire to remain on the mountain to our experience at the college conference? How can we take the light of the transfiguration or the good things of the college conference back to our lives on campus? So my first thought to share with you is, are we prepared to live by and are aware of what happens on Mount Tabor? Let me begin with some verses from Luke chapter 9. And behold, two men talked with him, O Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which was he was to accomplish at Jerusalem, the reference to his departure they were speaking of is the vision is that of Jesus going to the cross to die for all of us and for our salvation. The message of the cross seems to be at the center of this dialogue between Moses, Elijah, and our Lord. And it, basically, there can be no transfiguration in our personal life unless the Lord goes to the cross. And the well-known icon of our Savior called extreme humility is another example of what it means to be glorified. That icon is of our Lord folding his arms in submission and dying on the cross, and the label that is written on this cross is the King of Glory. Our Lord's glorification is first and necessarily manifested in his self-emptying love revealed in his crucifixion. We don't get to Mount Tabor or the resurrection without embraces his, making his, embracing his cross in our life and making it our own. The epistle of Paul to the Philippians beautifully makes this point. Having this mind, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not a quality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, he found, he, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every, conf every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. This is the ultimate expression of divine love that we've been talking about this week, of self-emptying love. And instead of Jesus demanding and trying to be all-powerful, I mean, people wanted angels. That, that, one of the things that his disciples had a misconception and other followers had of Christ is when he came into Jerusalem, he was going to rid all the corruption in the government. He was, he was going to come in and, and clean house, and he was going to put good people in government positions, and he was, by his power, he was going to conquer the corruption in the world he encountered by getting rid of bad people in offices and replacing with maybe his people and his army of people. But as we know, our Lord's weapon was not his might. As we hear in the gospel, well, he could have called armies of angels against his enemies to conquer them, but he didn't. In fact, as we heard of uh, Father, um, Father uh, Chris talk about the idea that his weapon is a weapon of peace. The cross is a weapon of peace. He fought the evil in this world by going to the cross and dying for us. That is how he conquered evil in this world. But I don't know how to put this. I mean, that may not marshal a lot of followers in the beginning because it makes Christ look weak and ineffective. You know, if he was really God, he would have... What did, what did, what did the people say when he was on the cross? Why don't you come down off this cross and show us, save us? The thief on the cross that did not confess him said, why don't you save yourself and then save us? And even the very people, the religious leaders that put him on the cross, were kind of challenging him to come down to the cross if he really was the Son of God, and then you could save us. But for him, and, and for the cross, the Lord, that was the only path he could take. 
Uh, Peter is a very interesting person in the Gospels because he says wonderful things about Christ that are truly right, but then he puts his foot in his mouth. He says foolish things too. And one of the things Peter could not comprehend in the beginning was when Jesus started telling his disciples, oh, I must go to the cross and die, and in three days I will rise. Well, Peter said, we'll have none of that, Master. We can't talk about that. And then Jesus, Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're, you're doing the will of men, not of God. And Peter had this tendency to kind of, I don't know, put his foot in his mouth. You know, um, he said he will go to the cross and die for him. But then Jesus said, you will deny me three times. I'll never deny you. Yes, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. But the good thing about Peter... You know, he may have made a fool of himself, but he was humble. He kept on coming back and asking for the Lord's mercy. He did not leave him. He, would, he did not abandon his Lord. And we know that Peter was one of the apostles, I believe, that was crucified on a cross upside down. Or was that Andrew? I think Peter was, was Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't think he was worthy of ascending the cross. So he got crucified upside down. So Peter is an amazing person because he's a model for us because we sometimes make fools of ourselves too and we make mistakes, we, we don't get it right, but then we also encounter the fact that the Lord is merciful and not only will forgive us seven times, but 70 times seven. So in this, in this icon of extreme humility, which is what I want to talk about, it, which I just talked about, I like the fact that on that, on that icon that you see in churches, it'll say on the top of the cross, the King of Glory. And it's not Jesus coming out of the tomb saying the King of Glory. It's the King of Glory is found in his divine self-emptying. That is what is glorified. And our Lord, as you know, in Pascha, we don't celebrate the cross and then the resurrection. Pascha means a Passover from death to life. The cross, the crucifixion, and the resurrection are one feast. They go together, hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And so our Lord, self-emptying love is the ultimate expression of love that we can learn from. And then even from the perspective of the cross, the very people that are persecuting him, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he did not look with condemnation upon the very people that sought to crucify him. So when we talk about exaltation in Mount Tabor, we have to always talk about the cross. And that conversation that is going on between Jesus, uh, Moses, and Elijah, which Peter witnesses, I'll, I'll make reference to that, but Peter says it's good for us to be here. But I, I wish we could have that icon of, of the transfiguration up because I'm going to get to that because... They don't look like it's weird when you see how the disciples are depicted there. And I'll get to that in a minute. The message of the cross is also alluded to in tone 7 of the Kentuckian of the Transfiguration. You are transfigured upon the mountain, and your disciples beheld your glory, O Christ our God, as far as they are able to do so, that when they saw you crucified, they might know that your suffering was voluntary and might proclaim to the world that you are truly the brightness of the Father. Our Lord did not have to die on the cross. He wasn't obligated to. Um, but his crucifixion was voluntary. He chose to go to the cross to ransom us from death. Thus we hear from Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so many great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So we have this idea of self-humiliation leading to exaltation, of self-emptying leading to being exalted. And the only way we get to the resurrection is through the cross. We can't say, <laughs> I'll take the joy of the resurrection, but not the cross. It doesn't work that way. It's only through the resurrection. It's only through the cross we can come to the, know the, the joy of our Lord's resurrection. Um, 
And I believe when, we, when that Hebrews word says the joy that was set before him, I believe that was us. The joy that was set before Christ to go to the cross was us because he sought to redeem us and bring us back and, ascend, and bring us with him into the kingdom. And so when the joy that our Lord had going to the cross was us, he sought, he sought our, our, our redemption. He sought our healing. He sought our desire to once again recover our true humanity in him. And so that's the joy that our Lord went to the cross for. Us, I believe that. I don't know if, if exegetes could, could correct me on that, but when I've always thought about what is a joy that was set before Christ, it was a cross, but that cross was, re, was for us. That the joy for him was to die for us and for our salvation and out of this great love he had for us. Um, St. John Chrysostom comments on the lack of knowing and the fear of the disciples experience at this vision at the Transfiguration. The other evangelists, indeed, let me I make sure. Oh, yeah, hang on a sec. Let me just make sure. No, I missed something here. So I got to my other theme here. Did Peter know what he was saying when he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here? Peter did not say, Lord, it is good. Peter did say, Lord, it is good for us to be here. But the scriptures also say that he was not aware of what he was saying. What does that mean? We hear from the Gospel of Mark. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. That's from Mark chapter 9, uh, verses 5 to 8. So this is very an interesting idea that Peter's saying, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And it, it is for us to ponder. He, did he really know? It says the scriptures say he didn't know what he was saying. And when you look at the icon of the transfiguration that we saw last night, are the disciples up there with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus saying, here's our buddy, it's good for us to be here? Where are they? Their lives are being turned upside down. Peter's kind of looking, blinding. I think James is upside down. I mean, so everybody's being discombobulated by this vision. And when they talk about it being good for us to be here, it's not like, I don't know, it's not like going out and having fun outside. There was something about this vision that was terrifying, yet at the same time, Peter was able to say, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Because I think when we look at the transfiguration, we, something, we see something of, of who we are being fulfilled in Christ, being glorified. That we're called to walk that same pathway by grace, as I've said several times. But it's a blinding light. And I remember the first time, when, as I started drawing close to Christ in my life as I became older, you know, I thought I was a pretty decent guy. I didn't do drugs. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. But then when you stand and draw close to Christ and stand in this light, you can't not but help and fall on your knees and bow down and worship. And then you begin to realize, my ways are not like his ways. And so there's this, there is this kind of, a, I don't know how to put it, that all of us in life have to come, have to, come to terms with that. This pathway of leading to repentance, that his, my ways are not his ways. And I have to be able to repent and say, Lord, I want to do your will. Help me. I can't do it without you. Now, in this vision of the lack of knowing, St. John Chrysostom says, the other evangelists indeed make the, made this clear and point out that the confused state of mind in which he uttered these things came from that second wave of anguish. Mark, for instance, writes, he did not know what he was saying, for they were terrified. And Luke says, not knowing what he was saying. Then to make clear that they were seized by great fear, both Peter and the others, Luke says, they were heavy with sleep, and when they woke, they saw his glory. By sleep here, he means the heavy drowsiness that had come over them as a result of that vision. For they experienced something like we feel when our eyes are dimmed by overpowering brightness. It was not night, after all, but day, and the excess of splendor weighed down on the weakness of their eyes. 
So in some ways, um, let me, I'm going to read one more quote from St. John Chrysostom, and then I'll, I think I have it in here, so just bear with me. Later in his commentary on this miracle, when, when they did fall on their face, St. John Chrysostom says, Why then did they fall on their faces on the mountain? Because it was a lonely, high, very quiet place, and its transfiguration inspired terror, and the light was unbearable, and the cloud immense, and all of, them, and all of which drove them into a deep mental anguish. Amazement came upon them from every side, and they fell down at once in fear and adoration. So, this kind of good, what Peter says, was also a terrifying good. He was saying it's good for us to be here because he saw something wonderful, but also something very terrifying that caused the three disciples to get all discombobulated. St. Andrew Creed offers the following. They could not endure the radiance of coming forth from that spotless flesh, brilliance that welled up from the divinity of the word when this person united himself to the flesh and shone through it in a way beyond nature, but fell on their faces, O oh, marvel, in a complete departure from their natural functioning, they were overcome by heavy sleep and by fear and shut off their senses. They ceased from all intellectual movement and completely lost all awareness of themselves so that in that divine and invisible darkness, above all light, they mingled with God. By not seeing at all, they received the true gift of vision and made progress and experience without knowledge and excessive knowledge so that they were led to share in a wakefulness higher than all intellectual attention. In some ways, by entering into that darkness of the cloud, there's a book written by St. Gregory of Nyssa about Moses going into the cloud for 40 days, and that dark cloud, that it's there when we perceive that, crowd, that cloud, and by the grace of God are allowed to participate in this. We, we by letting go of our natural eyesight, receive something greater, a greater vision of who God is. I think one of the interesting things, when Jesus heals people, you know, he physically heals them, but something else happens to them. They also acquire an eyesight with which to see Christ for who he really is. And what do they do? They follow him in gratitude. So there's a sight that's restored that may be physical, in the case of the blind man that he heals, the blind man that he heals, but it's also a sight that's a spiritual um, sight that is restored to see Christ with spiritual eyes regarding who he is and that's probably the greater mir miracle here even the people that he raised from the dead they were, they were to die again but in this healing of our Lord to restore sight there's another healing that takes place the restoration of a spiritual sight that gives us some ability by the grace of God to see the world from his perspective and not our own um, so Peter experienced a glimpse of joy. Oh, I'm sorry, let me... There's another hymn from Matins that we sing. You were transfigured upon Mount Tabor, O Jesus, and a shining cloud spread out like a tent, covered the apostles with your glory, whereupon their gaze fell to the ground, and they could not bear to look upon the brightness of the unapproachable glory of your face, O Savior Christ, our God, who are without beginning. Do you who then has shown on them with your light give light now to our souls? So there's so Peter did experience a joy at this event, but also a glimpse of fear and terror. He did not know what he was saying from a mere human point of view when he said it's good for us to be here. As you know, he talked about building booths for everybody, and it's almost kind of like he wanted to tax, capture this vision of our Lord transfigured and build these booths for Moses, Elijah, and Christ, and it's almost like he wanted to kind of keep them there. And he wanted to take this transfiguration and pocket it and preserve it. And the transfiguration went beyond that. Because the bottom line, if they talked about our words to cease on the mountain, there can't be any transfiguration unless he first goes to the cross and dies for us. And so the transfiguration was a preview of what was to come, but it's also a clear indication that our transfigured lives cannot happen without the self-emptying love of our Lord going to the cross. And for us being able to carry that cross ourselves when it's put upon us by the grace of God. 
The other thing I want to share with you is we can't apply the message of the transfiguration apart from living a Eucharistic life in the church. For all that we have spoken so far, the most important thing we will be doing, that you will be doing tomorrow, is receiving it. We'll be offering the divine liturgy tomorrow and partaking of the precious body and blood of our Lord. By receiving the body and blood of our Lord, we taste the fountain of immortality as we sing. Many churches sing this hymn as people approach the Eucharistic cup. But with that Eucharistic life, there is that ascetical life we are called to live in preparation for this. I love this uh, ecos from the canon of the Transfiguration. I'm not quite sure the word, what the word sluggards means here, but it says here, Awake you sluggards, for life, sluggards, S-L-U-G-G-A-R-D-S. Lie not forever on the ground in your thoughts that draw my soul towards the earth. Arise and go up to the high slope of divine ascent. Let us run to join Peter and the sons of Zebedee and go with them to Mount Tabor, that with them we may see the glory of our Lord and bear the voice and hear the voice they heard from heaven, and they proclaim that this is the brightness of the Father. So what Peter and James, John, did, what they did on the mountain, we're called to follow them and to go there with them and to also experience this brief glimpse of glory that we may be allowed to see. I gave that example of how the rock hiding Moses in the rock and how for me that's an image of our Lord's nativity. That in this cave, our Lord's there and he's revealing his light as a child, an infant, and shepherds and the wise men are worshiping him, bowing down before him. And they're seeing something glorious in that cave that they're allowed to see. The canonate verse from the Transfiguration expresses the ascetical effort involved and the resulting profit of, of, or beauty of this life in Christ. You have taken me captive with longing for you, O Christ, and have transfigured me with your divine love. Burn up my sins with the fire of the Spirit and count me worthy to take my fill of all delight in you, that dancing with joy I may magnify your both comings, Lord, who are good. Um, You know, I think, you know, we often talk about preparing and getting ready, fasting, prayer, almsgiving, and we know all about that. But the one thing I can, okay, I can only stress with you at this time is not that we have, we know that our Lord doesn't say if you fast, he says when you fast in a Sermon on the Mount. So the thing for us is to discern is why do we fast? Why do we, we deny ourselves certain pleasures? And today it's more complicated. It's not, just not about, it's not just about not eating meat and dairy products, although there's some of the rules, but we have many wants and desires of this life that can blind us to the work of God in us. We have passions. We have a passion, I don't know, we have a passion to be on the computer. We have a passion to be on our iPhones today that we're dealing with that we'd never thought of before. And, and so everything is about letting go of certain things that are good for the sake that we can learn to use them with a proper sense of direction and order, that we don't worship being on the iPhone, but we use the iPhone for the glory of God. And it's not just about food. There's so many things in life that we want. I remember years ago, there's a man who, had, um, who was blind from his birth as, as a child, and he had, he had surgery to restore a little bit of his eyesight, and we were talking about the fact that uh, he'd forgotten that the fast had begun. And he calls me up and says, can I have a blessing to have a cheeseburger? Well, why do you want the cheeseburger? And he just said, simply because I want it. And I think that was just a perfect example. We want things we don't necessarily need. And so we have to look in our own lives and ask ourselves, do I really need these things that I'm grieving over that I don't have? I remember we, I think, what was it? I gave it, I, I don't know if it was in my thesis or somewhere, but I think uh, there was somebody at seminary who, there was a challenge to kind of put away their iPhone for one week. And after one week, this man couldn't do it. It drove him nuts. Well, part of it is he maybe had good reasons to kind of use the phone. It wasn't just a passion, but... We live in a day today that now I can't even think about what it would be like to be without an iPhone. 
I mean, because it's so much a part of our life. It's, it's connected to us. It's glued to us. And uh, 15 years ago, that would not have been it. I think one of the amazing things I remember from my time as a priest in Kokomo is I knew the addresses and I knew the phone numbers of everybody by heart. Why? Because I had the dial. And eventually, they were just there and I could rattle them out. Now, forget it. Because with your iPhones, you don't see the phone, you just press a button. And you don't know their numbers anymore. It's a wonderful thing to have. It's a wonderful gift of technology that the Lord has given us. But boy, it sure can consume our lives when we try and think about living without them. So I think there's a point in fasting that we maybe need to take periodic breaks from using our technology to help us understand and discover the good reasons for using it so the point that we're not addicted to it. It doesn't run our lives. So uh, I wish to conclude this third talk with the words of St. Andrew of Crete. Knowing this, my fellow human, never convict yourself of being unworthy of grace or forfeit the heavenly life, which is free from all strife, through laziness and how you live here. Rather, drive out all laziness from your soul and shake off your attraction to material things. Become in every fiber of your being the pure devotee of better heavenly things and receive in the spirit the pure and blessed gift of sharing the life of the word, whose outcome is being made divine in the enjoyment of ineffable blessings. As a result, true virtue shaped and stamped by all the virtues will be revealed in you and in your steady contemplation of what is truth will be unveiled. To put it simply, may God be glorified in you through both these things, virtue and contemplation. God, who has contemplated and adored his trinity and who is the chief and purest goal of virtue and contemplation, because of him all other things exist. The goal itself has no cause. So, you know, we need to thirst for the living God in our life. And I think the, the, the one thing about fasting is that it enables us to let go of these kind of earthly thirsts and to do the one thing needful, to seek the face of God and to want to know him in the fullness of truth. You know, the one question that was asked that I'm going to wing it with you is, how can we take this truth and this, this experience of being on Mount Tabor here at this conference and take it back to our campuses? I didn't prepare anything about this. I have some thoughts to share with you, but it strikes me that one of the things I love about OCF chapters is that they're this middle ground, they're this kind of, uh, what's the word I want to use, uh, a vehicle through which the life of the church can be made known to people. You can do things on an OCF chapter that you not be able to do in a church. You can have conversations with people that are LBGTQ and speak to them in love and talk about how everybody, no matter how defaced we are, how much we've done to mar the icon of Christ in us, it's never lost. We're born with it. And you have this wonderful ability to reach out and love to those that are around you. And when I think about, you know, and what little I know about OCF chapters, there's a number of things I think they should be concerned with that I think a lot of them are. Number one, it should be a place where you learn about your faith. You have the ability to do teachings, have Zoom meetings, or even bring somebody in to talk to learn about what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. Number two, it offers the ability for fellowship, to be together, enjoy each other's company, which what you've been doing here through the talent show and other things. And there's a lot of social activities that I think are wonderful and should be a part of it. Um, the third thing that strikes me about OCF is that it should be this opportunity to be a witness to our faith and to share the love of Christ with the people on campus. And the fourth thing that I think is... You know, we talk, about, we talk about education, we talk about fellowship, we talk about worship. But one of the things that I, I think an OCF uh, chapter can do is um, it can be a place where you can serve. One of the things I've learned, we have, you've heard all this labeling of nuns and duns, people that kind of gave up an organized religion and don't think it does them any good, but they consider themselves spiritual. You know, one of the things that all of us, I think, love to do, especially people in, in this phase of your life where you're at, you love to serve. And so it'd be wonderful if OCF chapters would become places of service, 
where you could go as a group or you can invite people to a meal and feed them and sit down with them and get to know them as real people, not just as objects. You're not doing these things. You're not going to feed somebody just so they'll become orthodox. You're going to feed them because they're in need and you love them and you want to reach out to them. What they do with that will be up to God. It has nothing to do with you don't want to manipulate and do this so that something will happen. God is the one who will decide what, what will happen with that person. But whatever way you can reach out to people in service, and don't treat them as an object. Get to know their name. I'm 68. Now it's a lot harder for me to remember names, but I never give up. Because once you become, once I know you by name, then you become a person to me. If you're just an object of my attention, that doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't worry about getting to know your name, but your name relates you to somebody. You know, the name you get at your baptism also relates you to who gave birth to you. And I find that when you get baptized into Christ, particularly in a community, that unites you to the other people in the church that have been baptized into Christ. And so it's very important that in the book of life, people are known by name. Because by name, that means you come from somewhere. You have personhood. And you're connected. And when you have name, then you're connected to other people here because you've been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. So I, I just want to encourage you uh, to develop these notions of what you do in your ministries at OCF. And finally, if you're having a successful chapter and doing good at OCF, work with people who are struggling with that. Help them to establish one because I really believe OCF is a wonderful means by which it, it offers this beachhead to help kids that are kind of struggling with what they think and believe about church. They've been protected and gone to church all their life, and then they're on their own. They can make their own decisions. Nobody's going to haggle them to go to church. They can make the choice to go or not to go. And, and in your life, you probably know there's a lot of people who've been raised in Orthodox churches that when they go to college, they end up not going. And... I don't know. I mean, it's, it's their ability to kind of discover the fact they have choice now and that your faith is no longer a function of what your ma mom and dad believe. It's something you then incorporate into your life and make it your own. And once you make it your own, then tremendous things can happen. So uh, thank God for what you're doing here in these conferences because I think this is the one thing that you offer that for kids in this age of like 19 to 25, the church doesn't quite know how to address that. We, I think it's important that you encourage a relationship with a parish, but in some ways, I think the people you know at college will, will derive more fulfillment by being able to engage in healthy relationships with you as students, and hopefully that will lead them to come back to church because this is a wonderful organization but you still need the Eucharist. You need to still partake of the body and blood of our Lord, which means the church cannot be an option. It needs to be something you realize you need to do. Not you have to do it, but because in order to, to find new life, you taste this body and blood to taste and experience the fountain of immortality and a, a, a never-ending life of communion with our Lord. And that we find in the church. That we find in the sacraments of the church. So may God help us on this day um, in this final day of, of being together, that this renewal could always be ongoing. And the work you do here uh, in, your, in your OCF chapters are, is truly a blessing. And I can't thank God enough for what you do. And it's become, over time, more critical for me to make sure I let students know that are leaving high school and going to college to let them know of an OCF chapter, let them know this is an option. So if you're aware of any, any college students that's struggling because they don't have a chapter, do what you can to help them start one. Especially if you have good chapters and they're working well, maybe you have an answer for them about how they can work. I've seen both. I've seen chapters that go well and chapters that struggle. And I'm not sure I have the answer about why some do better and some don't. Somebody mentioned to me enthusiasm. Um, I think sometimes it has to do with who your sponsor is, the faculty sponsor, and, but it can't happen without leadership from the students. It's a cooperation, it's a synergy between your faculty sponsor and 
a student leader who wants to make this happen and is willing to do whatever is possible to make it happen. So anything you can do to encourage others that are struggling in this area, I think, would be wonderful. So God bless you. I don't know if you have any questions. I'd be glad to answer. The thing I'm most fascinated about by this transfiguration saint is Peter, his role in this, and the way he says it's good to be here. And if you look at that icon, just look at those three disciples, and their lives are turned upside down. Do they really know what they're saying? And that's what I think, in quoting one of the fathers, they were kind of outside of their experience. And through that experience of this blinding light, they came to see a vision of who God is but they had to let go of their own ideas of God and who he is. They had to let go of that. And, and they had to be blinded for a bit. So. Thank you so much. Okay, Your thank goodness. you. Thank All right, so God much. bless you. I think I speak for everyone when I say it's been such a joy to have you here. here. So thank, well, thank you, you so much. He is on his way out after this, so if you want to come up and thank him personally, be sure to do that in a moment. First, I have a couple announcements. So, we're about to go to free time. Um, 